Practice in Dogma by Dinko Grillick. Um, it's from the Old Marxist Humanist Journal Praxis from the 60s and 70s. Practice is a term which in a colloquial sense is very widely and very variously used. When we speak of a doctor's practice, we have in mind a very definite pursuit within a limited period of time. When describing a businessman as practical, we think of him as being able, resourceful, and shrewd. When pointing out the value of our socialist practice, we emphasize historical experience and assess developments which have taken place throughout a whole country, even a whole system. When arguing for a general session of abstract theorizing and a commencement of practical action, we mean all concrete acts in the sphere of sensuous material reality as opposed to those in the sphere of theory. It would appear that the last, most abstract, most general, and therefore probably most philosophical distinction has somehow become crucial in certain theses of contemporary philosophical thought. Indeed, it is just the determination of the relation, relationship to theory that is basic to many arguments about the meaning and purport of the idea of practice. Thus, the related terms theory and practice are often taken as being fundamental even when attempts are made to characterize practice from a Marxist position as a wider, more comprehensive notion into which theory can be subsumed. When the fact that theory is imminent in practice is considered to be the specific of human practice. Consequently, human practice from this point of view is always theoretical and human theory is inconceivable without certain practical repercussions if it really is a serious theory, i.e. a thought tending towards realization and if it is expressed within coordinates of a particular place in time and not empty speculation and idle thought. Human practice is thus distinguished from animal practice just because it is purposeful, planned, ideally preconceived, a consequence of its having first been theoretical. A frequently adduced proof of this argument is the well-known quotation from Marx's Das Kapital. Though Marx is dealing with the analysis of the concept of labor, not practice, and although the subject of Marx's objection is the narrower concept, which at best can only be part of universal human practice. We, we presuppose labor in a form that stamps it as exclusively human. A spider conducts operations that resemble those of a weaver, and a bee puts to shame many an architect in the construction of her cells. But what distinguishes the worst architect from the best of bees is this, that the architect raises his structure in imagination before he erects it in reality. At the end of every labor process, we get a result that already existed in the imagination of the laborer at its commencement. He does not only affect, he does not only affect a change of form in the material in which he works, but he also realizes a purpose of his own that gives the law to his modus operandi and to which he must subordinate his will. This thesis of Marx extended to all spheres, taken as absolute, lopsidedly interpreted as the basic characteristic of the total sum of human practice, has often resulted in theoreticians unconsciously taking it as basic and preponderant in defining the category of practice, relationship, theoretical, practical, ideal material, imagined, realized. Regardless, however, of whether practice includes or does not include theory, or whether both practice and theory can be comprehended only through same third thing, uh, which determines the possibility of establishing this relationship, the question nevertheless arises, can practice be determined at all simply on the basis of its relation, imminent or transcendent, to theory? A particular concept may sometimes not be determined and wholly explained only through a positive statement of the content imminent in it, and it is extremely important for the delimination of its scope and the comprehension of its meaning that it also be determined negatively towards that which is really opposed to it as its counter concept. What is then opposed to human practice? If we intend to determine negatively this central concept of Marxist thought according to Marx's fundamental views, 
although not always in accordance with certain of his own observations and accidental distinctions in some places where practice is even opposed to theory, we could, I think, argue that human practice stands in opposition to all that is passive, merely meditative, non-creative, all that is adaptation to the world, a yielding to the nature of the world and to its particular social conditions. True human practice, consequently, is not acceptance of the facts of objective reality and its laws of moral or ideological imperatives or accepted norms of something heter heteronomous in which man is always at a disadvantage and is the pawn of superior forces, spiritual or material. Human practice, as opposed to animal adaptation, could be defined as the true transformation of the world, a transformation which is historically relevant as an active interference with the structure of reality. Human practice is therefore not different from animal practice. Through being, or at least not only through being, always theoretical as well, but primarily because it transforms the world and does not conform to it, the world being always, epistemologically speaking, its object. Human practice is not creating self and not created because of particular conditions transcend transcendent to it because it is not, to use the old terms of Spinoza, only natura naturata, but also natura naturans. Consequently, put most simply, practice which deserves this name is always creative. It is not at all an ideal or actual state, but an unceasing living process of alteration and transformation. However, this process is not a process destined sometime to, to terminate in inactivity. It is not a process meant to stop being a process, not even on account of those factual imperfections of modern reality which aim at a conflict-free perfection. It seeks to attain no ultimate and final results, no life of bliss in this or the other world, in paradise or some promised land. Future practice towards which contemporary practice is open and is leading us will again be transformation. Accordingly, thus pra practice will never completely satisfy true human nature and the belief in such concrete, wholly unalienated nature is itself a sort of mythological alienation. Therefore, practice is a negation of that eschatological view which believes in the end of the world, the end of history, and the end of the possibility of the eternal development of human nature, i.e. believes in the final stabilization of human nature and society. Naturally, to define human practice, i.e. practice worthy of human beings, as transformation is still not to define it adequately in content. Certain questions are necessarily implied in order to avoid a banal relativism of the quality, purpose, and meaning of this transformation. But even without any closer definition, without distinctions, which could, for instance, in opposition to mere natural change be looked for in the sphere of historically relevant change, a change consequently including the concept of progress as well, such an empty definition of practice as transformation can also have quite concrete repercussions in the theoretical and sensuous real sphere of human activity. Man's fundamental vocation, his con cons constitutive characteristic and his mission, both as theoretician and pra practitioner, in a narrower sense, becomes so, to consider only certain ideological repercussions of practice thus understood, no longer a passive acceptance of everything that has once somewhere been established as correct, no transplantation of earlier theoretical principles. Man cannot, as for instance a philosopher, have the ambition to transform the world if he does not at the same time transform his own ideas and principles. It is therefore an inevitable prerequisite for him, in order to constitute himself as human, to be actively, personally, ceaselessly engaged in fighting for possibilities of an invariably new, increasingly progressive, non-standard thought and action. Practice thus ceases to be an inert insistence on something existent, some status quo ante or, again, a self-contented life in the past or present. On the contrary, it is made up of such human penetration into all spheres of reality that it transcends the existing and includes elements of projection into what is as yet non-existent into the future. 
such human practice cannot be resignedly made to conform to some general category, to the scheme of certain superhuman forces or material conditions. For this practice means self-awareness of the fact that the existence of these forces is made possible, and the conditions created and changed by man, the subject of real historical changes, leading from the kingdom of necessity to the never sufficiently free and never fully liberated kingdom of freedom. Practice is thus opposed to everything established, dogmatic, rigid, static, once for all determined, fixed, standard, to everything that has become dug into the past and remained hypostasized. From this point of view, dogmatic practice cannot be practiced at all. Therefore, it is in fact contradic contradictio in adiecto an insoluble contradiction, which can only conditionally be used as a term in order to make clearer the counter term, i.e. anti-dogmatic practice, or simply practice. For schema and dogma in variable em emphasis on the same principles, a faithful adherence to whatever has once been proclaimed true are nothing but a substitute for practical impotence. Therefore, a strict attachment to any once stated theses, even if they are the so-called fundamental theses, cannot be made to conform to the sense of the concept, the qu quintessence of all that Marx meant by human practice. This is the reason why it is absurd to insist in Marx's name persistently and in detail on everything that Marx ever and on any occasion said or wrote for anything regardless of the freshness revolutionary enthusiasm and intellectual force with which it may have been expressed may sometime become dogma and it may well be that today more than ever the basic historical assumptions have been negated of any dogma whatever that had its relative justification in certain historical conditions as an efficacious though frequently simplified slogan as a call to direct action it's just because these it, it is just because these historical assumptions have been so clearly refuted today that we often find ourselves in a paradoxical situation when even some dogmatists agree in principle that Marx's thought is no dogma, that certain assumptions should be developed and not allowed to stagnate and should be restated for and because of a different time. Therefore, even the dyed in the wool high priests of dogma at times, very resolutely and radically argue that quotation mania and a Talmudic approach to Marx should be done away with. It is thus persistently repeated from all sides that Marxist thought should have unfettered and full development. Even so, though dogmatists will admit it less readily, perhaps now and then only at intimate moments or within the closest circle, this line of thought is somehow not developing adequately. The idea concerning the transformation, if we do not count all those changes for worse, it has just slightly ossified, has become repetitive, has lost in vigor, freshness, and applicability to life. All those, and they are not many, who, like Plekhanov, Rosa Luxemburg, Lucas, Fromm, Marcuse, Horkheimer, Lefebvre, Bloch, Goldman, Kalikowski, and others attempted with more or less success to, to develop the idea individually were either completely rejected by those holding the official Marxist position, or were at least declared to be dubious theoreticians, replete with grave errors and constantly deviating to the left or right. It is therefore necessary with full force to ask the questions, why is this so? Why is it that this line of thinking, whose development is so fervently desired by everyone, still does not advance much or keeps deviating? It is an undoubted fact, as we have said, that in Marxist philosophy, as well in some humanities, a structure of thought has prevailed in which, both with dogmatists and with those that verbally disassociate themselves from dogmatism, it is emphasized until it has become little more than a tedious platitude that Marxist thought should develop in keeping with the changes of the real world. At the same time, however, as soon as anyone dares to say anything about some particular problem, which reveals a different view, deviating, however slightly, from the one held by Marx, he will find himself the target of a hail of ready, concerted, abusive, or ironical attacks. 
he is correcting Marx. We know well those who compliment Marx, who claim the right to criticize Marx, to be more contemporary than him, those primitive innovators, woolly-headed abstract humanists, renegades, etc., etc. It is beyond doubt that no reasonable person can argue that everything new is at the same time good, and that everything new also means the overcoming of the old. Moreover, frequently, and most often when Marx is involved, the question of authority is based on too simplified a dilemma, either original thought or the complete recognition of somebody else's authority, as if the entire history of thought and reality so far had evolved only around these two extremes. For, insofar as we do not tend to exaggerate, to paint everything with too restricted a palette, discarding all nuances, insofar as struggling against authority, we ourselves do not fall victim to the authority of inevitable and unavoidable needs for radical decisions. We shall be compelled to admit that the alternative, authority or one's own attitude in this most radical form, is only an apparent antinomy. Because there is no country or social system or ideological climate in which every germ of individual individuality has to such a degree been suppressed, that persons become simply faceless executors of every desire, idea, or accidental thought of authority, in which persons become such cowards, genuflectors, and adulators that they entirely lose any individuality. There is, likewise, no philosophy nor any major theoretical venture in history which, irrespective of its revolutionarity, is totally free of the authority of tradition. Nevertheless, in spite of all this, the question of authority, even of supreme ideological authority, is today an open issue facing Marxist philosophy. For how, this after all seems to be crucial question. the crucial question, the answer to which is nearly always avoided. Are we to develop Marxist thought at all? Not only elaborate it or scholastically systematize and complement, if we cannot in principle have different, even divergent views on some issues from those held by the classics. Marx is, it is almost banal to repeat this truth acknowledged today by many bourgeois theoreticians also, one of the greatest theoreticians whose intellect, will, and talent frequently transcend the horizons of his time. He is one of the towering geniuses of world history. However, are we to exempt from history Marx of all people, who had such a genius for and displayed such a profound insight into the essence of the historical, are we to declare him to be outside time and space, someone whose thought cannot become obsolete ever and anywhere, whose every word is inviolable law, surpassing all historical reality, and binding for all time and every historical moment? This can be effected only through a Hegelian termination of history. If we shut out those new horizons of theoretical and real historical progress, first so radically and daringly revealed by Marx. Within the same context of the problem of absolute and eternal truths, we may raise the question, why, in order to preserve at any price an almost mythological belief in everything said by the classics, and it very often passed over in complete silence, or at best camouflaged by various felicitous formulations and ambiguous terms, that Lenin actually had different views from Marx, and Marx from Engels in various, often fundamental questions. To be faithful to Marxism-Leninism, so favorite catchphrase, for many even now means adhering to all of Marx's and Lenin's dicta, often completely ignoring the fact that their views on some problems, partic particularly as concerns positive scientifically established theses, e.g. the tendency towards pauperization of the working class, scientifically deduced from the then obtaining figures on the constant decline of the proletarian living standards, are really antiquated, and that clinging to all their statements, and not only to actual words, but also to the spirit of sonic of their theses, now often at the same time means an inability to grasp certain essential characteristics of the modern socialist and communist movement. In other words, it means not being a Marxist. In discussions with orthodox dogmatists, such as the Chinese, for instance, we shall really not achieve much much just by wrangling about who has remained more faithful to, say, Lenin, because at times we shall find ourselves in the paradoxical situation that in certain questions dogmatists will perhaps be able to find in his works more appropriate quotations. 
and not only dislocated and thus fogged quotations and views, than creative Marxists. But is it enough to demonstrate that Marx and Lenin had different views on a problem from ours now in order to make it an eo ipso proof that we are wrong? And is not today's trend towards discovering the true Marx, the original Marx, very often also burdened by the view that being a Marxist today means finding confirmation for one's theses only in Marx's and Lenin's writings? To be sure, we can find in Lenin's work a whole series of quotations about the need for, among other things, coexistence and peaceful cooperation with countries of different social structures. But the Chinese can probably find just as many or even more quotations concerning the need for armed revolution and for the ceaseless and, in and inexorable struggle. This was indeed often emphasized by Lenin, and quite rightly, as an unavoidable prerequisite for the establishment of a socialist society under the conditions of the preparation and eruption of pro proletarian revolution, under the conditions of the birth pangs of the first socialist country, and of foreign intervention. If, however, what we might call conditionally our thought practice does not diverge from those coordinate systems which were the only ones within which thought was permissible and possible in the time of Marx and Engels, if we do nothing but argue that it is a dirty lie that we have at any time or at any place deserted classical thought, we shall not only be brought to a position when we can do nothing but helplessly and fruitlessly revolve within a scheme out of keeping with modern reality, but shall also often find ourselves showing that it is the dogmatists who are right, who are more faithful to the classics, more faithful to the spirit of tradition. For dogmatic practice is faithful, often more faithful than the most faithful religious practice to the past, because this schematism of dogmatic thought exactly lies in leaving thought in the past, in leaving it static, in arresting real history and the history of ideas at certain fixed constants. To face this fact squarely, emphasizing no blind faithfulness as the highest virtue and no attachment to the tradition of the classics as the sole standard for Marxism or anti-Marxism would be, it seems to me, one of the first but not the only prerequisites for any thought that wants to call itself creatively Marxist in our epoch. Today, unfortunately, even within anti-dogmatic theses, discussions of these problems are timidly and adroitly avoided, and a varying gradation of terms from rigid ones such as disloyal betrayal to more liberal ones like creative application helps towards settling the manner of thought into a mold which only obscures and certainly does not raise questions of attitude to tradition. It is indeed most paradoxical that in different variants, faithfulness should remain the fundamental category and virtue of those philosophers who believe that their thought follows in Marx's footsteps, when such faithfulness to their teacher was not shown even by those sterile philosophemes linked to the closed idealistic systems, such as the Neo-Kantians, Neo-Hegelians, and others. However, forcing on Marx some of our views, representing them as merely an elaboration and completion of what he allegedly started, but did not manage to finish, having been too busy, is really not an occupation that could be considered worthy of a Marxist thinker. But there is a magic word for all this, shelving every such attempt at transformation. We have got a magic formula, a reliable, tested label, blackening without redress every effort towards creative individual thought. This word is revisionism. Transplanted from a period when it really meant an attempt to weaken the essential revolutionary aspirations of the masses, when it meant dulling the combative edge, capitulation before burning issues, ideological confusion, and the betrayal of the proletariat, it still exclusively retains the perjurative meaning of a false, distorted approach to contemporary problems, and we seem very often to be afraid that this attribute might, no matter by which side, be attached to us. It is as if we as individuals were still apprehensive of being thus called. We do not it appears, ask ourselves whether it is now negative to state openly, without any pharisaic scruples, that it is necessary to carry out and keep on carrying out a real revision of certain views of the classics. Is not such a revision an imperative of the present historical moment, in order to save the fundamental humanistic core of Marxism, and 
in order that certain new revolutionary values of socialist and consequently creative practice may be created under contemporary conditions and carried over into a new period, as Marx did in the conditions of his time. Revising something, however, means taking personal responsibility and the fact that an individual, even society as a whole, might have to rely on himself, gives rise to apprehension in face of the unknown. This apprehension is revealed in the search for support in everything that can be found in the earlier thought of experience of the great, in familiar systems and the heritage of ideas. Thus, we shall often find and recognize ourselves in that, in, in that which we are not at all. This is only a slightly modified theological attitude and an instructive illustration of the possibility of appearance of the religious heteronomous man even outside religion. It is the attitude that it is exactly that other thing which can solely guarantee our own existence. That other thing is always the superior, better, sure, more reliable thing. It is that fulcrum, that constant, which can be found either in God or real human nature or historical determinants and all those things that will take the responsibility and risk for everything that we actually are. The static quality of dogmatism and the dynamism and changeability of true Marxist practice is also reflected in the attitude towards the function and scope of criticism. The hierarchical gradation of individuals statically determined in minute detail within a particular society requires also a precisely determined system in which one knows exactly who may criticize whom, where, why, and when. If anyone in any manner tried to shake or even simply question that conservative safe order, he would be met with incredibly obstinate opposition. So-called criticism from below, as if anyone could be up or down in criticism, as if those taking part in critical debate did not always need to be equal, may, under this system, only go as far up as individual managers, while senior leaders may only be subject to criticism by yet higher level leaders often completely ignoring public opinion um, believing that there are those who are qualified to criticize higher leaders a number of these leaders will laterally allow criticism to take even a vertical direction on the imaginary scale of critics and criticized however as it at as is characteristic of this liberalism that it often develops into a more frenzied and rigid, dog rigid dogmatism than ever before, since its representatives reproach themselves with their own liberality and broad-mindedness, which in the end brings even them into question, although it was they who had so benevolently given their approval to it in the first place. Then a hurried investigation of the life histories of such critics starts because it has always been typical of dogmatists to reach not to what it said, but by whom. Conferences behind closed doors are called, threats about familiarity with certain secret documents are made, hidden purposes and sordid aims are mentioned, the critic is unmasked as a former enemy, and the question which he has raised and the phenomenon which he has criticized do not attract a single word in the general uproar. Unless we can discard this kind of approach to problems and individuals in the sphere of ideas and reality, i.e. in practice, the possibility will always exist that a liberal relationship will be turned into disciplined restriction, even persecution, and an apparent and verbal humanism become open anti-humanism. Out of the fixed, settled, unchangeable sphere of the existing, we shall not be led into true socialist practice by anybody else, anyone from below or above not be admitted by an administrative permission or by any past confirmed at any level. Any anti-dogmatic, i.e. socialist or creative practice, or which is the same, simply practice or praxis in the Marxist sense of the word, can always and only be made and secured and must always be secured anew by us ourselves, i.e. only by those who cannot as men recognize anything human as above or below themselves, Woven into the fabric of his practice will be every single word of ours backed by a true conviction concerning the necessity of progress, every single action which is directed towards a real future from a dynamic interpretation of real contemporary life. Only thus, by refuting and demolishing all ideological and material constants, 
all soured unchangeableness, stability, petty bourgeois self-satisfaction with the already attained, shall we be able, as was so ingeniously done by Marx from the horizon of his world, to speak dialectically and contempor con contemporarily to the modern world and to transform impotent dogmatism, schematism into anti-dogmatic practice. In doing so, we must, however, be aware of the fact that the critics of past and the builders of new practice will at the same time be forging the critical weapons with which they themselves can be subjected to criticism, ever new and from ever new horizons. It is just this that is the true humanistic meaning of revolutionary practice, and this practice can never anywhere in the name of anything be stopped. It is by reason of this that man, that finite, mortal, impotent being, is practical, infinite, immortal, and omnipotent.